Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure for me to be here with you today and to discuss Amazing Grace as arranged by Frank Ticelli. And uh, this is, of course, one of the most iconic melodies ever written. Um, extraordinarily beautiful. And this is a beautiful arrangement as well. And I'm so happy to be here with you today to discuss a conductor's perspective on this, on how to bring this music beyond just the notes into something that is extraordinarily beautiful, extraordinarily meaningful, um, and just a really wonderful experience for both the students and the audience. Uh, you're an expert in what you do. You're an expert pedagogue. You're an expert uh, re at rehearsals. You're an expert conductor. And so where I want to try and contribute and help out a little bit is to bring some of the aspects that we focus on in the professional conducting world, like with large symphony orchestras at the top levels, well, what are some of the things that these top musicians are working on that you can also work on with your students in the classroom? And so I've you know, mentioned certainly one of those elements already that when we go beyond just notes being sound, into the sound meaning something. When, when the music changes our emotional state from where we are now to experiencing something else, almost anything else, we attribute a positive feeling to having our state change. And that's what it is for us as musicians and that's what it is for the audience as well. We through the music, go from where we are now into experiencing something new. It moves us, literally, in an emotional sense. And so that is what I want to help uh, bring your awareness and intention around and show some ways that we can work on that, as well as, of course, a lot of just the, the basic musical considerations that I would look at if I were preparing the score in order to come and rehearse with your band or to prepare a professional performance uh, with professional players. Um, so without further ado, I would like to actually share a little clip from YouTube that you can uh, look up and uh, watch yourselves uh, as well. Um, but I've got it uh, loaded here and I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. So now this is a uh, comedian who is talking about bringing our reason why to what we do, into bringing a sense of purpose into what we do. And this is an amazing little uh, clip where he uh, plays an interaction that he had with a music director from a school. And he talks about why. So now I'm just going to share this with you. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Uh, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid, I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. So I find that every time I've watched that, I get chills. I, it's so powerful. And what I find amazing is that it's the same guy and it's 30 seconds apart, the two versions. And this is really what our job is as, uh, as a leader, as a teacher, as a conductor, as a musician, is to seek what is the potential in this given moment to create an experience, to create meaning, uh, to create beauty, to go beyond where we are now into what is possible. And that man had that incredible version of Amazing Grace within him already when he did it the first time. But he was prompted to change his intent. He was prompted to think a little bit differently, uh, to have a different reason why that he was doing it. And the result is just I mean, two worlds apart. And that is what I hope to bring when I go to work with an ensemble. When we go in and they are in a certain state, they're in a certain place, and then now I'm going to work with them, I want to try to bring them to where is the best place possible that we can get to together uh, to get the best results together for this music and uh, to get the best performance possible. Now, easier said than done sometimes, but at least the intention being there um, can make a big difference. And I'd like to discuss uh, that intention today um, in Amazing Grace. Now, I'd like to share some of the things that make this music so iconic and uh, why this melody still moves us after, I don't know how long ago it was originally written. Uh, this arrangement isn't all that old, but the melody, I'm just looking at another score here. Um, the melody is, is well over 100 years old in any case. Um, now, let's listen to the uh, YouTube version of uh, Frank Ticelli here. So we'll go through this kind of one section at a time. So first of all, the intro. To the melody. Okay, so a uh, very beautiful eight bar intro here. Um, and let me just get to the score. I experimenting with a digital score here. I hope you can see it okay on the on the screen here. In this introduction, we've got a lot of different elements, of course, we're starting um, well, let's start with the poco rubato and tempo indication here. Um, now, this kind of tells us that the arranger has in mind a fairly free, um, free flowing feel to it. And what I would do with this is start the piece at 72. And then as we kind of come up to this beautiful swell here in the fifth bar, that's when I would bump the tempo up gradually through the crescendo here to kind of end up in closer to our 80 to the quarter. Um, so the indication here is 72 to 80. He just means, you know, in that range somewhere. And I would encourage you anyway to think about starting a little bit under and moving it a little bit forward and then we've got room uh, to do our writ 
here in, and arrive at the slower section. Um, so I wouldn't write accelerando, which would be probably too drastic. I would just encourage a little bit of forward motion through the crescendo. So for example, da -de 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 -de. and then and then the flutes are in. De -de 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 -de. in order to have time to let things settle. So we don't want it to sound rushed. We don't want it to sound like an abrupt change or anything, um, but I think it's just nice with a bit of motion in it. Now, of course, the arrangement asks for a nice pianissimo entrance. Slow, soft music is far more challenging than fast, loud music um, in that the intonation has to be there uh, it's very noticeable if it isn't. And the control, of course, of being able to produce a beautiful, healthy, centered singing sound while being in the softer range of the instrument. And so definitely a wonderful exercise for developing control and for developing listening. Um, now, we're going to be talking about both the horizontal and the vertical aspects of the music today. The horizontal being the, the structure. How does the piece work in time? How do we build a musical line? Um, and what goes into making a phrase musical? And it's a little bit harder for me to help here with, um, with the vertical structure, which is the sounds happening at the same time. Uh, because of course intonation, um, well, that's something that has to be worked on, uh, the tuning, how the instruments blend uh, and all that. That is something that's circumstantial and according to the level of the band, the level of listening that the students have. Um, so that is a, very much a, a, you know, a beat by beat and bar by bar type of, of process. Um, for everyone to be listening and to be working on, you know, in the rehearsal process to stop on certain chords, to tune the root and then to tune the fifth and then to place the third into the middle um, and to build chords like that so students are able to hear when it's in tune and when it's out of tune. Um, so there's uh, an important aspect there. And also, though, something that I would like to hopefully help with a little bit today is just to call to attention the, the importance of balance between the sections so that when we've got a singing melody and we've got an accompaniment, uh, the accompaniment is in the background, the melody is out front. We don't want the melody to be well supported by the accompaniment, but we don't want the accompaniment to be competing with the element, uh, with the uh, melody. And so we're going to talk a little bit about different types of sounds that we could have. Now, that's something that I would like to encourage in this introduction is to think about and to ask the students, well, is this introduction something that, like, what's the character of it? Is it something that's solid and heavy? Or is it more transparent? Is it more like air, like water? Is it fire, earth. I think we're probably quite clearly in the water side or in the air side of things, if we're thinking about the elements. And I think that it, it has a fl flowing and floating type of quality to it. It certainly reminds me of French music, of uh, Claude Debussy, of Ravel. Um, and one of the main characteristics of French music is that in opposition to German music, Beethoven and Brahms and uh, you know, that's Beethoven and Brahms is grounded, it's anchored, whereas French music sought to be out of gravity and to float and to be free and to be more transparent and floating in its characteristics. And so that's what I associate this intro uh, much more to. And so rather than a heavy, dense sound, we want to seek a transparent and light sound through this. Um, so the challenge of bringing in the attacks without bumping the sound, without creating a sudden increase in volume, but as each group uh, comes in, such as you know the euphonium and tuba here, and each of the successive entrances of uh, of the instruments, that they don't cause a noticeable 
uh, change in volume, they just start to add to the color and they blend in um, with each successive entrance. And then this beautiful little crescendo here that takes us up towards this fifth bar and that we sustain the sound through the fifth bar and the sixth bar. Okay, And then the rich will start to happen here in the seventh bar and the uh, decrescendo only begins here once we've gotten to our second beat. We don't want to already be too soft. We need to leave room to do a nice decrescendo all the way into the pianissimo here. So generally a mistake that, that people commonly make is that the second they see the start of a diminuendo, they already play softer. Whereas the diminuendo just means from this point, start to reduce the volume. Um, so don't anticipate the diminuendo too much. Make sure that, uh, that things sing and sustain across these, uh, the fifth and sixth bar, which will help contribute to a nice eight bar structure. Now, of course, the, the conducting gestures, you want to try to encourage um, enough air, enough support, while also encouraging forward motion and pianissimo and a soft nuance. So I would certainly encourage more horizontal gestures versus things that are vertical. Um, and so to make sure that there's a proper breath and that the upbeats lead across the, uh, across the bar line. Now in this opening here, something that I think the recording maybe could do a little better is that we don't wanna accentuate the start of the downbeat. Okay, on this half note, it's a long value. I would start the half note as softly as possible and then sustain, maybe grow across the half note a bit, but certainly not. Da -di -da -di. If we accentuate the start of each uh, bar with the in our three, four, it's common to go one, two, three, one, two. We're going to end up with a pedantic bar by bar thing. And that's what we certainly want to avoid. What we're aiming for is creating this long sailing line that takes us across eight bars. So da -di. I would even think of perhaps a diminuendo would be the most effective thing from this upbeat into the down so make sure that there's enough sound to get a, a good entrance, but then decrescendo into the downbeat. And then from there, you're going to have room. Now, of course, I, by decrescendo, I don't mean an attack on the upbeat. It should be pianissimo. But thinking of it da -di, changes and makes us listen differently. And it sends us into uh, something special something transparent, something that's going to communicate. Okay, so without wanting to stay too long on any <laughs> given bar here, um, the, the idea is to create a story, to create an atmosphere, to give a character to the music that defines it as something special, um, that it goes beyond just the sounds into creating something out of gravity versus something heavy, something transparent versus something thick, something that will flow and sail. Now, once we get into the, the start of the theme itself, this is, like I was saying, one of the most special melodies uh, ever written. And one thing to keep in mind when we begin this tune is that we are going to be very preoccupied with making sure that it is a 16 measure um, melody here. So I'm just going to mark here 16 measures. Um, so I'd mark that at the top of my score. And just as a reminder that it's going to be four bars, plus four bars, plus four bars, plus four bars, okay? So four plus four plus four plus four. Plus four. Things are commonly um, four bar phrases are ultra common in a lot of music. And as such, they can become a little bit predictable. And this is one of the reasons that this melody is so special is that it doesn't deliver what we would expect it to deliver in a typical four bar phrase. Um, so let's look at what I mean by that. First of all, when the E flat sax comes in with 
So four bars. Notice that the way the arranger has marked this here is slur, slur, slur. Uh, this is a little bit dangerous in the way that it's written um, in that we really need to make sure there's a sense of the, the four bars here, um, that if there are, is any breathing or rearticulating, it has to be within the context of the longer line. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that in a four bar phrase, we want to generally lead towards the third bar so that we can resolve in the fourth. And so um, what I would do here is think, da di sing across the half notes, keep the half notes very alive. Da di 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 di. Now, the melody starts to drop. And what people would normally do when a line drops is get softer, right? But it starts to drop in the third bar, which is the bar that I think we need to shape towards. So, da di ya da di da di. Now, do you hear the difference? When we make sure that there's still musical tension in that third bar, it instantly becomes more beautiful. And we feel more of a resolution of the tempo of the tension in the last bar. To sing through that half note. Now, again, it's too much to say crescendo. I would not say crescendo necessarily. That might be too abrupt, but singing, singing so that it does have a shape. Now, in a sense, it could be a crescendo, but we are in the general nuance of mezzo piano. Mezzos are dangerous because they're kind of like, well, medium, we don't always express something when we're in that medium range. It has to be singing, um, ideally a little bit of vibrato if the, the student is able, but certainly uh, we want to make sure that there's musical tension. This entrance here of the, of the glockenspiel is marked uh, mezzo piano, which is the same nuance marked here. It has to be background, however, an accompaniment. It's not as important as the melody. So a nice a chime sound uh, for color that'll happen while the half note is singing here, um, but certainly nothing in the foreground um, just a color effect here. And then when the clarinet and the flute come in, uh, it's one only, pianissimo in the, the flute, piano in the clarinet, uh, that these entrances shouldn't be too abrupt or accented. They just kind of uh, a nice warm addition of sound while the alto sax continues to sing at the slightly higher nuance. Now, We've done four bars, we've got 16 that we need to keep in mind, okay? So one of the, the, the first thing that made this special is that as the melody falls in the third bar, it's actually got more tension in it uh, than what uh, would happen normally if we just had a descending melody. Now we get into the next set of four bars. Um, so let me just see what key, uh, this is E flat. So, da da di di da di da da di. Now, what would normally happen at the end of a four bar phrase? We would resolve. And then we would start the next four bar phrase. But that's not what happens here in, in this amazing grace tune. That he goes, ya da di. One, two, da di di. It takes us across um, the, the seventh and eighth bars have a crescendo and it leads us into the ninth bar of the phrase. So because it doesn't just go four bars, four bars, four bars, four bars, but does four bars with a nice uh, accentuation or emphasis in the third. And then the next set of four bars leads us all the way across into the next. 
Uh, it's extraordinarily beautiful. And uh, Ticelli has some nice effects here with, uh, say, the clarinets coming in pianissimo, pianissimo, triple pianissimo. Uh, the, the clarinets, of course, being the instrument that can really sneak in uh, from barely audible at all, uh, and then do this nice crescendo to mezzo forte. Um, in the clarinet line here, there's this little tenuto, which so I've marked here as espressivo. Normally a tenuto mark means, well, when I ask people what it means, they say hold the note full value, um, which yes, but, um, but what it is is expressive generally. And so, and when there is a tenuto mark, we are holding it for its full value, but we're also generally articulating. In this case, there's the tenuto, but it's also within the context of this longer line and in the context of this uh, crescendo here. We do have to re-articulate because we're going to be repeating the same note, but I think it really means to make sure that it sings and is expressive all the way through this second beat. And then there isn't a large break here, but just rather a slight rearticulation um, as we go into the third beat and across the bar line. Now, this trumpet with the mutes here, mezzo forte, well, that's, you know, that's a higher dynamic level. Um, but we don't want this, to, this effect to be too prominent. It's just color while our melody is singing. And so I think these muted accents here, yes, mezzo forte is in order to make sure that they have enough ping to them uh, and that the entrance is clean, clear, crisp, bell-like, um, but it should not be more prominent than our melody here, which is a mezzo forte. There's a difference between a melodic mezzo forte, which is our main interest, and an accompaniment mezzo forte, which is there to accompany our melody, of course. Um, now this uh, one only in the horn and one only in the euphonium and, uh, and the tuba. Each of these entrances, like before, um, just a warm, unaccented, but, um, but centered sound and something that, that creates roundness, openness, to make sure that the sound um, has enough space. And, uh, Anyway, the, there's lots of teachers who can help with that, lots of specialists and band. I'm certainly not one, um, but uh, I hope that I can be of service to you anyway as a musician here. Um, I certainly work with brass a lot and I played trombone and tuba in my youth, um, but uh, I know there's a lot of training out there to help improve the sound, the resonance, and to make sure that things are, are free and ringing um, in the body so that they are that way in the sound as well. Um, now, when the melody heads into the last four bars of the 16 bar phrase, uh, we've got an entrance of the second E flat sax, the alto sax, and we've got uh, the second clarinets also joining it. We want to make sure that they match the sound of uh, the soloist, um, that they don't go over the sound of the solos, that they blend in with it, that the intonation be right spot on, the tuning be right uh, together in there, and, um, and that it continues to sound as one instrument. Uh, but with just a richer sonority and, and character. Now, when we get to measure 21, there's some accents here with sustained notes. I've marked up here, I'll slide down, bell-like, bell-like accents here. We want to make sure that there's a, a, a clear entrance, uh, but while they are kind of more of a percussive type of accent, uh, they don't have to be dramatic. It's just, again, like a like light color. We want to make sure we're still out of, uh, out of gravity, out of the heaviness thing, and, and in the lighter and in the singing side of things. Um, then there's uh, some beautiful counterpoints here. Just note that the tenor line with the second horn line with the euphonium, uh, a nice crescendo that goes up to mezzo forte while the main melody is resolving um, along with all this coming here, there's some beautiful swells in measure 22. Uh, so we've got some, 
really nice singing going on in our main melody. We've got some interesting counterpoint that swells in bar 22. And then we've got another interesting counterpoint in the lower instruments that's going to peak in bar 23 with everybody ending up at piano uh, by the time we get to 24. Um, so just some really wonderful textures there to, to work on and to work on individually so that they know kind of how they fit, make sure that everybody listens to the melody to know where that is and how their line fits in with that. Now, when we begin in 25, this is the second time we're going to hear the melody, the subject. And I thought perhaps here it would be useful to talk about line a little bit because we've got the trumpets, the horns, uh, the third clarinet, uh, oboe, as well as the flutes now all coming in. So we've got the standard things about intonation and blend and everybody singing together. And we want to make sure that we create a long line. Well, what does a line mean? I know it's something that we hear uh, talked about a lot in music. And I was in my bachelor's, uh, doing my bachelor's of music, hearing this term thrown around all the time, more line, longer line. And, and, uh, and it took me a while to understand what it meant. So I'd like to share now how I've come to understand this notion of line. And perhaps it's a, a metaphor and analogy that might be useful to your students as well. So when we have a succession of notes, so say we've got this da, di, um, ba, di, 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 di. Now we tend to see note, note, and then we have to hold it and then note, 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 right? So this kind of vertical aspect of playing this sound and this sound, we count the right number of beats, we play together and make sure everybody is together. So absolutely, everybody needs to be together. We need to play the right notes at the right time. But if we think of this in terms of a piece of string or fishing line or something like that, but let's, let's, go, with, um, let's go with a piece of string. And if you were to place that string uh, in the shape of an arc, now in music, we're usually dealing in terms of curves. Um, artificial things, machines tend to deal uh, in you know, hard angles and straight lines, but in nature, uh, generally things are not in straight lines. Um, and when we speak, it tends to not be all exactly on the same level. When we do that, it becomes a robot, right? So again, into the mechanical thing. Nature um, generally has fluctuations. So let's just, for the purpose of this example, think of placing a string on a table or something that has a curve to it. And then if we imagine the notes as beads that we would be putting on to the string. So now each of the notes is an individual bead, but they're all connected by this string that goes through them. Right? And so in a necklace, of course, we attach and it becomes a, a circular thing. All of the beads are connected. Um, now, when it's music, those notes are different heights, they're different lengths, um, but they are connected by that musical line. So you could picture it as, in a way, perhaps um, um, a necklace that has the beads have perhaps different heights. Some can be above and some can be below, depending on the height of the note, but they are all strung together on this curved shape. And so as time passes, we go along that bead and we play the notes, like in Guitar Hero or something, uh, these games where you know the notes come down and you have to press them at a certain time. So time is going on, but Da di ya da di da di da di. While we're holding a note, da di, we're progressing along that string. The note is not static. Progress is being made in our line. It's coming from somewhere and it's going to somewhere. And we want to make sure that the connection between the notes in this melodic case, be as smooth as possible, as legato as possible, really connecting through, but that our intention and our expression really carries through all the bars, okay? Really carries through the length of that string. 
All right, so does that help? If you have any questions, certainly don't hesitate to ask, send me an email, uh, contact me, and I would be happy to provide some more materials. I'll, I'll provide a diagram of this in the Mastering Musicianship course that I'm putting together um, just to, to help with the visual of this. Uh, but in any case, the idea of line is that we have differing notes, we have differing values, we have different speeds and all this, but they are strung together by this, uh, by this concept of line. Now, when the melody starts, we've got mezzo piano, and then we have uh, the saxophones and the low brass and the clarinets that come in piano. Now I've put these in brackets. I tend to do that when we've got a big 2D entrance here. Uh, we don't want this to be percussive. We don't want this to be too strong. We don't want it to interfere with the beautiful line that is going to be happening here in our melody. And so I put it in parentheses because, yeah, piano, it might need to be softer, um, but in any case, it needs to be an accompanying piano, something that is more transparent than our singing melody. And then we've got here these accents. Okay, now this accent is exactly the same symbol as what we had here, except that the purpose of the accent is different. These ones were bell-like percussive accents, whereas these ones, I see them as being more of an espressivo, okay? That, and now the reason I say that is that they are in the context of a slur, of something legato, and they are a resolution, okay? So this is an appoggiatura that's going to resolve. In each of these cases. Now, that means we could attack this with a hard percussive like attack, but I don't think that's the most effective way here. I think it's more beautiful to make it be expressive through the note. So the accent here would be just a little bit spread out. It'd be a little bit less at the start, very beginning of the note, but instead be like a da da, like a sigh, a res resolution, it's something that, that grows in the middle of the note a little bit. Da, da, so that it's expressive, okay? Um, and it's just context that tells us whether an accent will be a percussive vertical accent or whether it will be an expressive melodic accent that happens through the course of the note. Um, and then now something here to be aware of, we see a crescendo. Well, like I talked about with the diminuendo, usually the minute we see the start of a crescendo, people are already louder. We want to make sure that we give ourselves room here. Just a reminder that the dynamic was just at, at mezzo piano earlier. We want to make sure that we haven't risen uh, too far above that or above that at all. Or if we have, to start perhaps even softer here in measure 31 in order to really provide lots of contrast. You may wanna go down to a piano dynamic even. Just experiment with what uh, sounds the best, what feels the best in order to create lots of contrast as we then head up uh, through the middle of our phrase and have this beautiful summit here um, with the forte. Now we've got some more of these bell-like accents happening on the second beats. These are nice uh, touches in the orchestration. Um, and uh, but just a sec here, I'm just going to see what I, I can't quite read what I wrote here in my scan. Just let me check my other score here that I scanned from. Okay, right. What I wrote here is to keep the accompaniment underneath the melody. Okay, so we've got a mezzo forte accompaniment. We've got notes that are moving here. We want to make sure that they don't take precedence over the lovely singing half notes that are happening in our main melody. Okay, so there's some busyness going on, um, but that busyness has to be background. Now we've got these groups of eighth notes. Yeah, da, dee, da, dee. Now, generally, whenever we have a change in direction, uh, we want to feel that there's a kind of a curve, an expressive curve that happens here. And so the way I've marked this, it, it's like imagine if you were in a car going down a hill 
And then suddenly the hill changes direction. You, you go down to the valley and then you start heading up the other way. Well, if that were happening, you'd be heading down and then you'd go, you'd feel pressed into your seat. Or another way to think of it is you're driving and the car turns the corner while you would lean a little bit against the door, right? The centrifugal force would kind of push you against the door as you go around the corner. Well, that's the same thing. We want to feel these forces, these natural forces that occur in music. And this is another way that music moves us. Uh, and that it communicates to us is that when these natural laws that we all understand so well, we spent our childhoods playing uh, by bouncing, by running, by being on bikes, and what makes play fun when we're kids is experiencing our body moving in space. Uh, in the space around us. And so we feel the laws of physics. Uh, we don't think of it as physics, but we feel um, fun. We, we jump up, we feel weightless, and then we land and we feel the gravity or as whatever, a roller coaster, this sort of thing. Um, so just a slight bit of phrasing here. Usually when we're saying phrasing, what we mean is to make sure that not every note uh, has exactly the same volume and is flat, right? The musical lines here, the, the staff has these stiff, very straight lines so that we can see the notes clearly, but we certainly do not want to play the notes in a way that is vertical and stiff. We want to play them in a way that is curved and expressive and always beautiful. Okay, now um, things start to uh, come down volume here once we get to bar 35. So make sure um, that in 34, the, the line starts to drop, but don't let the volume drop. Really sustain through in order to arrive uh, at 35. Then start the, crescendo, the decrescendo after you've gotten to your downbeat of 35. Just extend the line. Nice long line there. Okay. And then this uh, beautiful little articulation of the last four bars of our um, theme. Okay, um, some lovely little scale entrances here. Uh, we've got our, our timpani down below as well as we start to head into uh, this transition. Uh, a little bit of a key change going to be happening here. Um, and a slight retardando with uh, a breath mark. Now, I encourage you, I, I didn't uh, keep going in the recording. Um, but I certainly encourage you to, to listen to recordings. Don't listen to just one, listen to different ones. Um, but uh, also, so that can help us, you know, get a good idea of the piece. Now, the danger of recordings is that we rely on them to know how the piece goes without really knowing exactly what the notes are. And for me personally, there's a massive difference in the way that I conduct, if I've just listened to a piece so I know how it goes and then I go and conduct, versus if I've taken the time to play every line that the musicians have, that each instrument, if I go to the piano and play the line, I'm a pianist by training, but for you, whatever your instrument might be, if you play the notes that the students will be playing, you are going to have a relationship with those notes, you're going to feel them a certain way, and you will conduct in a way that is so much more musical. Um, and well, at least that's what happens for me, maybe your conducting is already extraordinarily musical. Uh, but once I've sung a line, or once I've played the line versus just having listened to a recording, it's an entirely different experience of the music. Uh, it's much more genuine, meaningful, and I have a much clearer intention uh, with how the music is expressed, how the line goes, uh, the nuances and all that. And so I'm much better able to have a clear concept for the ensemble that, that I'm conducting. So recordings, yes, great, important, uh, but they can also remove possibilities that we might have found in terms of color and transparency or intensity or singing and all that, things that we would find if we were to be uh, playing the music ourselves or singing the music ourselves. Certainly get your students singing. I, I can't recommend that highly enough, um, that we are always imitating the singing voice when we are playing an instrument. Now, when we have this little breath mark here, there's a thing in the, um, in the foreword where he says it's not meant to be a big uh, stop in the piece, but rather just 
a breath to collect and to uh, start this transition section well together. Uh, definitely a more vertical percussive type accent here. Um, uh, quite a beautiful color. This reminds me a bit of Leonard Bernstein, actually, in a way. Um, some things from West Side Story. But anyway, as an aside, uh, now we've got these, the, the, the bell-like attacks and then these little things coming in on uh, the third beat. And then da, 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 the staccato means nice and light and coming away, a decrescendo. So as I mentioned uh, just previously here, don't think of this in terms of being a straight line and just a straight decrescendo. I would actually think of this in terms of being a curve. Whoops, I can do that uh, better here. Um, so a curve where we actually curve towards the second beat a little bit. Yeah, da, 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 da. And so instead of da, 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 or it should go upward, da, 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 da. a straight line like that is fine. It's, it's, it's right, it's what's written. But if we think of it in terms of a curve, yeah, da, 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 da. just gives it a little bit of swing in there that makes it more expressive, better phrased, more beautiful, which is still absolutely possible in something that is light, like these staccatos. Um, staccatos are sometimes thought of as just short, uh, but we need to think of them as short and light. Okay, while still having a shape. Now, the arranger is very clear about this being an echo effect here. So we want to make sure that there's a big contrast between piano and mezzo piano. That might not be so easy to achieve if we're just thinking literally in terms of like how close these two dynamics are. You may, you may want to think of this as like a strong mezzo piano and a soft piano or a more transparent piano and a little bit denser mezzo piano, something like that. Um, in order, whatever you end up thinking about, uh, the important thing is to get the contrast, okay? And then uh, this nice entrance here from the horn. We've got this, uh, these little kind of variants on the opening fourth. So we had da -dee, right, as the uh, start of our melody. Well, so now uh, Mr. Cicelli will play with this fourth, these kind of bell-like accents are all in the fourths. And we have this one, we've got this one starting here. Um, and to make sure that each of these uh, sing and that we hear that uh, we recognize that opening fourth from the uh, melody. Okay, so now I'm just going to look at my score for a second here because uh, my markings aren't coming through. Great. Okay in the scan. Now, one thing that uh, I should mention is we had the percussive bell-like accents here. Uh, here, there's lots of them. Make sure that you're aware of, of where they are and in, instruct the players on you know, what type of sound, the attack, and then coming away, not sustaining through the half note um, with a ton of volume. Yes, playing the full value, but attacking and coming away so that it's, it's transparent and so that uh, the, the others, um, there's just kind of this, this nice texture versus an accent that's uh, really um, horizontal and going all the way through. But then now, this is a beautiful little uh, contrast here in that when the horn starts, we have the fourth being legato. And so we want to make sure that this little line here, that it will sing. And it happens in a little bit of a canon here uh, that'll go into the clarinets. And then there's another one starting up here in the flutes. And that each one of these entrances sings and we'll have this nice beautiful um, canon happening we've got this entrance down low here um, in the third clarinets and this nice singing fourth in the oboe as all part of this uh, general flow and these colors that are coming through um, and so each one of these can just sing nicely all right, um, so when you study your score, you wanna make sure that uh, it's clear 
what sequence they come in and that each of the, the players knows who they're coming in with so that they all breathe together and that they match their sound. Um, for example, here's another pair here, Oops, I don't, um, between the tuba and the second bassoon. Um, so each time kind of happening in pairs, we've got a poco writ here, right? So we're going to let this start to um, relax a little bit. And then an a tempo here at the start of bar 56. And again, going back to the accents. So just to have fun making these sort of sequenced entrances really be distinct. Okay. Um, it's part of the interest of the section is what in terms of what's happening nice mezzo piano dynamic uh, i'm just going to move through this portion a little bit quicker we spent a lot of time on the earlier part of the movement but this is um kind of a break from our melody a little bit of a writ here um okay keep the forward momentum going the nice ringing a nice pianissimo here and then this beautiful entrance from the clarinets. Okay, mezzo forte legato, legato in contrast with these bell like pings. We've got legato here. So each of these sequenced entrances, the fourth here, um, another writ here, which is not poco writ, but is actually a little bit more than. You know, this one we writ poco, that means just a slight amount. This one we can writ a bit more on. We've got now this um, da -dum, which we had at the start of our uh, transition section. Okay, and we are back into our original tempo here. Now, getting towards the conclusion of the piece. Now, in here I could speak about. Well, it's just more of the same thing as what the, where the work is, is in balancing and singing and making sure that the tone is beautiful, um, making sure that the chords are all nicely tuned um, in bringing out the little details here, such as these to really go through and make sure that none of these uh, go unnoticed. Okay, and that these pairs uh, work together. These ones are each the little bell-like percussive accents. Well, we have the, the resolutions going on, each of these details, a crescendo that is starting here gradually and which is going to lead us all the way towards uh, the forte that's going to happen at 83 here. Uh, this is a beautiful climax. Um, remember again, he, he marks this time mezzo piano, leave room for the crescendo. Uh, we've got forte here. Now, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's we want to make sure that this is broad, it's beautiful, it's a big arrival. But to keep in mind the larger structure that we're going to be heading up towards the fortissimo here. So very full and singing, but without overdoing it because we need to leave room. Uh, for this crescendo and for this big opening up and this sort of dramatic climax here. Um, so still keeping uh, our melody clear um, without the accompaniment drowning it out, but everybody now playing in a much uh, more open, full way. Um, it'd be a little easier for the air in a sense, but we still need with all the breaths happening uh, in order to get all that air through the instrument, we want to keep uh, a real sense of the line. Now I've marked these triplets here. This is a beautiful little uh, detail. Um, I've marked uh, that the horns here, uh, we want the horns to be very espressivo. Okay, oh, that's where the, the composer actually marks it here, that very expressive, this line. Okay, try to have them sing out and then a nice resolution coming away after that big climax and then creating after all that energy, this dolce and es molto espressivo uh, melody. So the intimacy here is very effective after the big rich sound that we've had uh, going on through this section to make sure we diminuendo a lot and that then returning to this nice solo that we had 
uh, from the beginning to conclude the melody. Okay, now each of these entrances, we've got, um, we've got to make sure again, the round attacks, uh, the transparent round sound um, with a nice resonance. Okay, um, this is a beautiful and interesting chord progression here. And then this little challenging, but beautiful effect at the end, uh, where the flutes and the vibes uh, have to line up and we've got just these little uh, swells that, um, well, this is very challenging as well, going down to triple pianissimo. We want to make sure that this, this cutoff here is clean, um, that it sustains not too abrupt, um, but we want to make sure that it is also together and not, not a jagged uh, exit here. It's helped a little bit by this swell happening in, in the clarinets. Um, but still something that we want to make sure is um, being soigné. We say in French, uh, soigné, like uh, well, uh, well tapered. Okay, just in, and keep the listening and the energy through all the way through. Um, and this kind of extraordinary triple pianissimo close that clarinets do so, so well. Um, along with the flutes, everyone here needs to, I think, come off in... I think the gesture for both the brass and for the winds, we want to make sure that we, we're doing a circle that cuts up like this versus something where we would go down, right? If you go down, it's like it stops the sound. Whereas if we, we lift upward, it's sort of the sound stops, but the energy lifts and it creates space. It creates uh, still there's listening going on um, and we finish in this beautiful suspended state and so the conducting will be fairly um, vertical in order to get these um, ringing quarters in the last two bars but then when it comes to getting the sustain and the cut and then keep the diminuendo going and then cut and go up. And just allow things to be up before lowering your hands and uh, ending the piece. Okay, so to hold that space, that silence, um, if possible, I mean, audiences often jump in with their enthusiasm and the, the clapping, but I think this is a, a beautiful spot to just kind of hold the silence for just a moment after uh, the music has ended. Um, so I hope that uh, this has been helpful for you and uh, just a reminder that the reasons why we're doing this can make a massive difference. And so if we are uh, looking for color, if we're looking for expression, if we're looking to say something personal, um, something beautiful, whatever our intention is, it will change the quality, the effect of the music and um, and can certainly make a difference for the students. So uh, thinking of the words of the song and what they mean and what the context is uh, and how uh, you know a former slaver uh, recognized his wrongdoing and expressed regret at how he displaced so many people and caused so much suffering. Uh, it's a beautiful story and very poignant and relevant to our times. Um, and I think this kind of hymn to, to reconciliation, to acknowledgement, uh, is, is an extraordinary, extraordinarily beautiful and, and moving piece to be working on with your students. So I hope you enjoy. Um, I wish you happy music making and all the best. <laughs>